Hi everyone, Nick here at Modulus Props. I'm a pretty big fan of the Lord of the Rings films. I love the costume designs and I've been wanting to build an orc helmet out of foam. For that build, I'll need a pattern and to create that pattern, I'm using this little one quarter scale Urukai helmet. Weta Workshop is the production company that made the props and costumes used in the films, and they also produce collectible versions of some of those props, including this little orc helmet. To me, this is one of the iconic helmet designs from the series, and because of its relatively straightforward shape, it's perfect for recreating in EVA foam. To create my pattern, I'm pulling a tape pattern, meaning I'm covering the miniature with blue painter's tape, then marking all the edges and corners with a pen, and then I can turn that into a pattern for foam. The helmet is symmetrical from left to right, so for some of the sections, I only need to pattern out one side. I'm starting with the section that will become the main part of the helmet shell. The tape ends up being about two to three layers, and I add it in sort of a crosshatch pattern, which helps it to stay together when I peel it off. Next, I mark the edges and the corners onto the tape using a fine tape sharpie. And then I carefully peel off the tape, making sure the layers stay together. Now I can create the tape patterns for the other sections of the helmet using the same method. First this spiky side panel thing, and then the crest at the top, and finally the faceplate section. Now I'll trim the pattern pieces using the outlines I drew, and this is when I would typically add any darts if needed. A dart would be a split partially through a pattern piece, allowing me to get a curved section from a flat shape. I didn't actually need to add any darts to my pattern, but I do have one that's sort of built into the shell piece, and that's because I traced around the edge of the crest piece, giving me a seam in that spot. Here I'm dividing up that crest piece. I think this will be easier than trying to force a complex bend into this piece. That might be possible with enough heat and coercion, but this will be easier for me to control. As I trim each piece, I'm adhering them to a piece of cardstock so I can draw in some additional details later and also so I can run them through my scanner. The helmet has a few overlapping sections, so a few of the edges on my tape pattern need to be adjusted. On the shell pattern, I'm adjusting for the area covered by the crest and adding in this little corner section and drawing in the edge that overlaps with the side panels. The faceplate just needs a little extra material on each side where it gets overlapped by the side panels, and I'll end up putting a bevel on these edges later. Next, I scan in the patterns, then use an imaging program to scale them up by 4x, and then print them out at my new scale. I don't have a large format printer on hand, so I'm actually just using my imaging program to print the patterns in sections, and then just reassembling those sections by hand. I'd like to keep these initial pattern pieces intact in case I decide to come back and make some changes, so I'm creating a second copy of each one. First, by outlining the pattern piece with a thick black marker, and then tracing that outline onto a blank sheet of paper. Now I can cut out these pieces to use as my working pattern. The faceplate section ended up a bit more asymmetrical than I'd like, but I can even it out by folding it in half tracing the back half through to the front half, and when I cut it out, I just split the difference between the two outlines. Once I get my pattern pieces cut out, I can finally get to the fun part here, which is some actual foam smithing. I'm using HD foam from SKS Prop and Costume Supply, and I have two thicknesses I'm working with, six millimeter and 10 millimeter. For the shell of the helmet, I'm using 10 millimeter because that will give me a good sturdy base to work with. With my pattern pinned in place, I can use a ballpoint pen to transfer it to the foam. Before I start cutting, it's always best to start with a nice sharp blade, so I'll give my knife a few passes with my sharpener, and then on to cutting. Along a portion of the top seam of the shell, I need the pieces to come together in a corner, so I'm starting the cut at a slight angle to give me a bevel, and then I straighten out the blade as I go. 
Now I'm ready to start gluing. I use barge contact cement and I always wear a pair of rubber gloves and a respirator. This stuff is toxic, so be careful with it and make sure you have good ventilation if you're using it. You don't want to be breathing in the fumes or getting it on your skin. I find barge works best if I keep it as thin as possible. If I'm gluing a seam, I spread it on both sides using the brush applicator and then I go over it with a little piece of foam to squeegee off any of the excess glue. Then I give it a few minutes to dry and then I carefully press the seam together trying to keep the pieces lined up as best I can. Slow and steady wins the race here. As I glue together the two halves of the shell, you can see how it ends up pointier along the top, and that's where my edges were slightly bevel cut. One of the great things about this HD foam is that it takes bending and shaping pretty well without needing any heat. So I can just fold in some corners here on the front of the helmet to give it the sort of boxy shape that it needs. For the faceplate and the side panels, I'm using 6mm foam to keep it from being too bulky, although 10mm would work here just fine too if that's all I had. The faceplate has a couple sharp corners on it, and I could have put some seams here, but instead I'm using a back bevel technique. On the back side of the piece, I carve in a V-shaped trench with a blade, and that allows me to get a sharp bend in that spot when I fold the pieces together. The only seam I need to close on this piece is this little section here down the center. Now I can glue this piece in place, making sure to keep it centered and level. Then I can glue on the side panels, again making sure I check for symmetry from side to side, and giving things a little bit of curvature as I go. The last piece I need to fabricate is the crest on the top of the helmet, and for this again I'm using 6mm foam. Before I glue this piece in place, I need to take down some of these sharp corners with my rotary tool. I want this piece to look like it's one continuous piece of bent metal, but I won't have access to some of those sharp edges after it's been glued in place. So far so good, the overall shape looks correct, but I need to soften more of those hard cut edges. The bits I typically use for this, by the way, are these aluminum oxide grinding stones. They're just abrasive enough to remove foam quickly, but not so abrasive that they just chew right through a piece. The key here is to use a light touch and go with the rotation of the tool. I'm carving out a few small chunks as battle damage, and then I'm just grinding down all the edges. I'm going for something that looks hand hammered and dented. To seal the foam, I'm using Creature Cast. It's an air drying neoprene rubber and it comes in a few varieties. This one is the black semi rigid, and in this case, I'll actually be using it as part of a cotton batting build up technique to add some texture to the helmet. The batting comes in sheets which I can spread easily by hand. Mixed in with my Creature Cast is a thickener called Neothix, which is sold by the same company. This thickens the neoprene for brushing, giving a consistency which is sort of like a very liquidy yogurt. I'm using a chip brush to apply a thin layer of the Creature Cast onto the foam, and then over the top of that I'm stippling on little sections of the cotton batting that I've stretched thin. A few things to note here, Creature Cast is non-toxic, but I'm wearing gloves just to make cleanup a little easier when I'm done. Also, I didn't bother heat sealing my foam with a heat gun. If I were going for a smooth finish on this helmet, I would have heat sealed it first before applying the neoprene, but in this case you won't end up seeing any of the foam surface anyways. 
The creature cast has a gray color when it's wet, but as it dries, it will turn black. For a more even texture, I can use my fingers here to help flatten things down. It has a drying time similar to that of acrylic paint, so because I'm applying it fairly thickly here, I have plenty of time to manipulate the cotton batting before the neoprene sets up. After letting the outer surface dry, I added a texture to the inside of the helmet as well. Here's how it looks after fully drying. I could have moved on to painting at this point. I think this texture works really well for a rough hand forged metal appearance, but I wanted to take it a little further, so I'm adding two more layers. The next one is a layer of creature cast stippled on with a chip brush. I often use this stippling technique by itself without the cotton batting because it gives a gritty texture that I like. Here I'm using it to fill in the texture a little more and to cover spots that didn't get much coverage by the cotton batting. Before adding my final layer, I need to add in some rivets. There are a bunch of ways to do this. Googly eyes are a popular choice, but I wanted something that I can shape with a Dremel to give a hand hammered appearance, so I'm using discs cut from a 10mm dowel. To glue them in place, I'm using super glue. For gluing large sections, I prefer barge because it gives a much better hold, but for small bits and bobs like this, the super glue is sufficient, especially in this case because we'll be getting a layer of sealer over the top which will help keep them in place. Back to my rotary tool, I'm just grinding down the rivets so that they look like they were hammered into place. Now for the final sealing layer before painting, I'm using this bounce rubberizer material from Hotwire Foam Factory. It works somewhat like white glue or Mod Podge. It goes on white, and then as it dries, it turns clear. And when it's dry, it stays really flexible. It does self-level a bit, so it will take the gritty surface texture I have with the creature cast to something that's overall a little smoother and shinier. I've done some paint tests with and without the bounce layer, and I think the smoothness it adds really helps to sell a metallic finish. Finally, we get to some painting. My base coat here is a layer of Angelus flat black. These Angelus leather paints are great for foam because of the flexibility that they have. I do find that this flat black still has a fair amount of sheen to it, and I'm applying it thin because I want some of that glossiness of the bounce to show through. To give some contrast and depth with the next paint layer, I'm going as flat as possible. I'm using some of this Tamiya flat base mixed in with this MSP paint in a color called Ruddy Brown, which I think works really well for a rust color. This is why I always put thick paper down on my workbench while painting. Yeah. This mixture with the flat base dries pretty fast, so I'm working quickly to brush on a thin layer, making sure to work it into the texture in the corners, and then use a damp paper towel to wipe away only the paint on the surface, giving me this dirty, rusty look. To provide a little more variety in color, I'm adding a couple sparse layers using these paints from Createx Colors. These are both from the Bloodlines series, Decay, which I like for dirt, and Surgery Sienna, which is another great color for rust. These paints are typically used for airbrushing. I like them for weathering because they're thin and transparent, making it easy to keep things subtle. Using a chip brush, I'm just stippling on some of the Decay color for little spots of dirt here and there. And the sienna color I'm applying a little more sparsely just along some of the corners where rust might form. One final step and I can call this helmet finished. I'm using this metallic paint from Formula P3 called Pig Iron to dry brush some metallic highlights along the edges and the high points. 